Um, and so as Bill mentioned today, we're gonna to talk about uh, the travel demand or, and micro simulation modeling suite that we developed for Grand Cayman. Um, Grand Cayman was interesting because it's uh, it's got some unique features. So a little bit of, a bit of background about the island is it's the largest of the three Cayman Islands. It approaches 60,000 residents and around 76 uh, square miles. Uh, most people think about Grand Cayman and the nice white sand beaches and the blue water. But for the residents, they experience some pretty significant rush hour queuing and congestion every morning and every afternoon when they go to and from work. Um, on top of that, they're also experiencing a significant growth both in uh, full-time residents and also growth in tourism. So um, developing a modeling suite for an island had some unique challenges, uh, particularly some challenges. So there are some uh, transit issues on the island. The first is that uh, they've got you know many schools on the island, but most of them don't actually provide school buses. So they've got a pretty interesting uh, morning and afternoon peak where people go from residences on the eastern or western side of the island, they drop their students off in the schools, which are located right around this area, and then they go back or they go forward to go into Georgetown to go to work, which creates a lot of congestion and some pretty significant lines, both at the school and then the routes leading the school. Uh, they also have a fixed route transit system, and you can see the map of the transit system um, on the slide, that also operates with a lot of flexibility. The uh, bus drivers actually are known to deviate significantly from these routes to perhaps pick somebody up or drop somebody off that they know. And if the routes really aren't producing the fare revenue that they uh, want, sometimes they may skip portions of the route in order to make it a little more economical. So that was definitely a challenge from a modeling standpoint. Another unique aspect of uh, modeling on an island is that there are really only two external stations. And for those of you that do uh, travel demand modeling, you know how unique that circumstance really is. So people that enter the island either enter via the seaport um, which is right here in Georgetown, or the airport, which is on the other side of Georgetown. There are also um, was a challenge with the model and uh, the you know the provision of travel data because there was no detailed travel survey that was avail available for the island, and the uh, you know data services like Streetlight at the time did not provide um, OD information uh, on the island. Route choice is also a challenge. Um, the island gets very narrow through this section. And so there's a significant bottleneck as the commuters come in from the eastern part of the island and try to access Georgia. It's a very multimodal, particularly in the tourist area where there are a lot of uh, pedestrians, bikes. Uh, there's also transit, a very active uh, transit uh, uh, taxi service throughout the island. Uh, we'll be on freight. Um, one of the interesting things was that the uh, cruise ship terminal actually is a cruise ship terminal during the day and at night is actually where they load and unload uh, cargo from the island. They then transport that to a central facility where it's then distributed throughout the rest of the island. There's also a challenging mix of uh, travelers. We've got residents with the school trip pattern that we mentioned earlier. You've got short-term visitors who arrive on a cruise ship in the morning and then disembark um, on a cruise ship that same day. Then long-term visitors that fly into the island, um, set up temporary households and then operate um, like households until their uh, duration of stay itself. So. There's a lot of seasonal variability here. Um, these are the, uh, this is a graphic showing the arriving airline passengers by month. You can see that residents and uh, workers are pretty stable throughout the year. However, there's a peak tourist season uh, in the winter months and then beginning of the summer vacation here in the U.S. And then there's a drop off in travel during the later part of the summer where it gets really hot and you run into uh, hurricane season. The uh, land use challenges that are, are exacerbated by sort of the planned growth. So this is a map of the anticipated growth by 2036. The uh, most residential growth is anticipated in the eastern part of the island and the uh, western part of the island, whereas most of the employment growth is still going to be centered around Georgetown, which just makes the current congestion um, all the worse by the time we get to that point. So the purpose of our uh, model or our effort here was to create a suite of modeling tools that would allow the National Roads Authority to plan near-term and long-term transportation investments. Uh, we were uh, able to develop a suite of tools that they can use to do scenario planning to test different land use uh, policy decisions as well as transportation investments. Uh, one thing to note for those of you who are from the U.S. is that when we were doing intercept surveys and we said we were working for the NRA and we had questions about the travel behavior, that certainly caused some consternation. So we learned that we had to say National Road Authority, not NRA, when we were talking. So the suite of tools is really uh, three different sets of uh, modules. The first one is a travel demand model, which we developed in Vizu. It's an island-wide uh, model that accounts for residents, visitors, and freight. 
We then have a refined macroscopic operations model where we apply Pico fuzzy to the travel demand model to get it even more well validated. And then we can provide um, detailed performance metrics at the intersection level, for example. And then a micro simulation model, which uh, again, transfers data from the macroscopic operations model using AM adaptive to develop highly, a high resolution micro simulation model. Um, one of the first things that we needed to do uh, is to uh, better account for the types of visitors that are on the island. So with that, we conducted both a short-term visitor survey at the cruise line. The uh, roads authority was able to set up a, uh, a time for us to go down to the port as people were re-embarking onto their uh, boats after visiting for the day. We could ask them about their uh, detailed travel uh, behavior. And then we also conducted a uh, long-term visitor survey where we intercepted travelers around the island to ask about their travel behavior. The overall model flow basically takes the uh, socioeconomic data, roadway data, planning studies, and land use applications, as well as the uh, target validation data from traffic counts through a GIS data hub, which is then imported into the Vizum travel demand model. Vizum travel demand model produces pretty solid screening measures of effectiveness, as well as customized and automated summary maps, and we'll show you some examples later on the presentation. And then uh, that information is translated down to the operations model, which can provide even more detailed measures of effectiveness, as well as some uh, simulation videos, which were very impactful for uh, the decision makers that we presented them to. The resident travel demand model is a standard four-step travel demand model with a peak axis between the traffic assignment and the initial skim matrices. Uh, it accounts for uh, traffic assignments for motorized vehicles, as well as buses, pedestrians, and bicycles. The uh, visitor models were actually tour-based models that we developed. Uh, we have a short-term visitors tour-based model where all the trips begin and end at the cruise ship terminal based on the survey I mentioned earlier. These Monte Carlo simulation um, based on those local surveys. Uh, we also, it also allows user inputs so we can vary the number of cruise ships assumed to be in the harbor in the days that we would be evaluating because that does fluctuate by day of the week and by season of the year. We also have a long-term visitors model, which is also a tour-based model. And the uh, trips are generated at the uh, temporary residences uh, where may, maybe at a condominium or an apartment that people rent or a hotel room or a, or a bedroom in somebody's house. Also based on the local survey. And for that one, we're able to, as a user input, to account for the seasonal variability, uh, input different uh, assumed hotel occupancy, which would model the, uh, the seasonal behavior I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the primary difference between the uh, travel demand model and the macroscopic operations model is demonstrated on this slide. The uh, information on the top left-hand corner, or corner of the uh, screen is the validation data from the travel demand model for the PMP counts. So you can see that the R squared is 0.895, which in this case is, is quite good for a peak hour um, estimation. But once we applied uh, T-flow fuzzy, we're able to get the R squared to a 0.9. State, and you can see that the scatter plot indicates a much, a much better validated model. At that point, we're able to take the information from the, from the model in the bottom right hand part of the screen and really confidently predict intersection level operations. Some of the standard performance me uh, uh, measures that the model can create are on this slide. On the lower left hand corner, we've got level of service information in each intersection on the island, as well as level of service information uh, along the links within the island. Up on the upper left-hand part of the screen was one of the favorite graphics from the uh, decision makers in the demonstration. And that's a graphic that shows delay by color. So the dark red and the darker the color, the higher the delay. And then the, um, the depth of the bar indicates the level of volume. So for example, you can see that this link has high congestion but low volume. And this link represents a bottleneck. It's got high congestion and high, um, high volume. We also use the uh, blocking back method or model um, within Vizum to really allow these bottlenecks to operate as constraints for downstream traffic flows, which was very important, uh, as you can see from some of the slides Lindsay, Lindsay's going to present. We also produce standard graphics or elements such as vehicle miles of travel by level of service and then travel time contour maps, which were also, we found, were very impactful for decision makers. So in this case, it's how long it takes to get from uh, any location on the island to the cruise ship terminal in Georgetown. And you can see that the darker is worse. When you look at different scenarios, it's a very quick way for uh, people to understand the impacts of scenarios. 
We used the Visum Scenario Manager because it was a streamlined process, not only to house all of the data in one centralized location and organize the files, but also to save time by creating multiple modifications once and assigning those to individual scenarios without any recoding. And also when modifying the base network, it automatically updates the modifications and the associated scenarios without making changes multiple times. While the VISU model encompasses the entire island, our VSIM microsimulation study area really focused on the western, more congested half that captured the three major roadways on the island. Some of the challenges that may occur when doing a macroscopic and microscopic model separately may include network changes having to be done twice, which could be very time consuming and in turn result in quality control issues when trying to keep the models consistent. The traffic volume assignments may also be different between the models. We used PTV's A&M Adaptive to further enhance the process, not only to create more robust models, but to work more efficiently and overcome some of the previously mentioned challenges. This process links the VISUM and VSIM via the Adaptive Network Modeling. So in VISUM, you have the roadway network, routes, matrices, and signal timings that can be imported into VSIM, which saves time and reduces errors. The routes don't have to be multi-run in VSIM, there's less coding required, and the network changes are done once. This process helps maintain consistent assignment and analysis. With that, there were some lessons learned when using the AM adaptive process. For example, some of the network parameters we had to check and were fixed once imported into vSIM. For example, detection had to be activated for all necessary vehicle classes, and the public transport lines had to be accurately routed with the designated stops. We also discovered missing detectors at the roundabout approaches, which impacts the, op the approach operations. As you can see in the top graphic with existing conditions, you have tiny connectors at each approach, which help the vehicles navigate through the roundabout. When you have the A&M adaptive on top of the existing network, these mini connectors disappear. So we actively worked with PTV to resolve this issue in a subsequent service pack. We also had to reincorporate some adjusted calibration parameters such as driving behaviors if an area had been modified from existing conditions. Once again, the top graphic shows you your existing network with the orange and green links representing adjusted driving behaviors. When the AM adaptive comes on top of the existing network, these adjusted driving behaviors revert back to the default. So the ability to bring over calibration adjustments at modified areas would enhance and save time but the AM adaptive process is still an advantage because the rest of the calibration adjustments remain intact. So we have to ask ourselves, does our microsimulation match existing conditions? From the AM import to the cleanup and checks I just described, we have the dynamic traffic assignment already set up because we have the seamless transfer of the routes and matrices from Visum, so we don't have to worry about rerunning costs and paths in VSIM, which saves time. So then we can move on to the model calibration and validation to capture the local driving behavior and the local flare. In order to capture the local flare, it is very important to utilize the detailed data collection efforts. We had a team travel down to Grand Cayman on a field visit to conduct various observations, including multimodal interactions, see how the pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles all work together, and then general observations to assess driving behaviors so that we could customize the behaviors to match the local observations. An important and uh, focal point of the behaviors was the lateral behavior, which permits <clears throat> different modes of traffic to interact on the same link. We wanted to make sure we accurately depicted that cyclists maneuver around slower pedestrians while vehicles maneuver around both the cyclists and the pedestrians. We did not want to cause any unnecessary congestion of a vehicle driving three miles per hour behind a pedestrian because they could not get around. Another important aspect of the local flare were the roundabout operations. Grand Cayman has several single and multi-lane roundabouts of varying sizes. And as you can see on the right-hand side, these are actual pictures of a multi-lane roundabout with its extensive queuing. And this is because there are courteous yet aggressive circulating and entering motorists. 
the courteous circulating motor motorists tend to hug the inside lane to allow the approach motorists to enter the outside lane. However, these approach motorists still hesitate, cause a stuttering effect to cause this extensive queuing and very frustrated motorists. Some of the microscopic performance measures we provided to help decision makers included speeds, queue lengths, and travel time. The front graphic you see here is a direct visual output from vSIM that shows the speeds along the roadway system. Red indicates congestion and green indicates the free flow conditions. We also automated spreadsheets to help the client easily pull and summarize the vSIM results. Uh, the model three is extensively. Um, they were able to model uh, already committed projects as well as additional long term projects. Uh, they were used to show the impacts of potential road closures and determine mitigation strategies to restore baseline. They provided insight to the Census Bureau as far as uh, how they could modify their, uh, in, or their uh, census documents in order to provide better information to the travel demand model. Uh, put depart planning department officials in order to evaluate different uh, land use scenarios, plan how those can impact and improve future travel. And government officials, with both the ministry and the cabinet. For example, uh, Lindsay and I were able to go down and present the uh, findings of some of our studies to the cabinet and the premier, which was a, a very uh, you know impactful presentation. These are some examples of some of the uh, information that we have presented. Uh, similar to the graphics previously, the uh, darker the color, the worse the tension, and the higher the bar, the, uh, the more vulnerable. You can see the uh, immediate difference, and it's very easy for decision makers to determine the benefit of some of the plan projects when you toggle between the before and after conditions. With increased growth and a system at near or oversaturated conditions, the microsimulation model depicted the rise in travel time and helped predict the operational degradation based on knowledge of the current congestion without the localized improvements. However, when the short-term improvements were incorporated, the model produced a significant travel time benefit to help decision makers confidently implement certain projects. Along with roadway widening between the Silver Oaks and Grand Harbor roundabouts, we also suggested incorporating roundabout metering at Grand Harbor to enhance operations and further mitigate the current congestion. With these combined improvements, as you can see in the graphic, the maximum queue is significantly reduced. And the roundabout metering was a quick operational enhancement implemented in the field that produced positive results as the model had predicted even without the roadway widening. The NRA provided us the opportunity to join them on a helicopter ride to monitor the congestion, which worsened within just a single year due to school time changes and increased single occupancy vehicular use. From a bird's eye view, we were able to see the positive effects of the current roundabout metering, which matched the model, and conducted a metering test on adjacent roundabout by communicating with a police officer on the ground when to stop and release specific approaches. So in real time, we could see positive results. As in any area, there tends to be competing interests. The airport authority wanted to expand the runway to accommodate larger planes, but could only do so by closing Crew Road, as you see here, and pushing westward because water is on the eastern side. As you can see, there is severe congestion currently on multiple roadways, including Crew Road, during the PM peak. So we used our powerful modeling tool to demonstrate the potential impacts of closing this roadway. So as you can see, with the short-term improvements and the roadway still in place, the travel time from points A to B is approximately 30 minutes. We used the Vizum macroscopic operational model and its blocking back module to show the compounding congestion with only adding less than a mile of travel when closing the roadway from points A to point B. And you can see that the travel time nearly doubles. And we presented these impacts to the airport authority as they passed the straight face test on our knowledge of congestion to help an informed decision and investigate other roadway or other runway improvements. One of the best things we do when we develop a uh, tool like this for somebody, which is a one-off model, it's actually a tool that uh, the client is able to use again and again to help um, make decisions. 
is when you start to see the uh, the modeling penetrate, you know, broader in the market. Cayman Compass is the uh, newspaper on uh, on the Cayman Islands, and it's actually featured a series of over the past two years that have kind of demonstrated some of the benefits that the model has produced in both transportation or land use planning decisions, as well as helping to convey uh, future plans. You can see that uh, as of uh, February 17th, 2020, an article regarding how the, uh, you know planned investments from the uh, NRA were going to improve travel. And uh, as long as it works, to show you that they actually even included a video from our modeling um, on their website to help convey the impacts. Uh, a nice shout out to PTV and his tools, as well as the uh, insights from the modeling that we have prepared and some of the simulations they use. Um, from my perspective, it's a sign of a really uh, effective modeling tool suite when you're able to communicate to a variety of people, not just engineers, um, the benefits and the impacts of uh, investment and decision making. Okay, we can open it up to any questions that anybody has. All right, Scott, Lindsay, thank you so much for that great presentation. I, I uh, didn't look up the reference. I, I, I should memorize it, but uh, you know, I'm sure I, I, the rest of the day, everybody's gonna have a challenge to live up to the, the you know, I'm dating myself, but who, whoever came on after the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, right? So that was before my time anyway, but excellent, great presentation, very thorough, excellent uh, example of the um, multi-resolution modeling and, and all the different steps along the way. We do have a few questions. I'm gonna start it off with one of my own, which is your local flare slide. So I, I'm assuming if I'm interpreting that right in the way that you described it, um, it it's kind of uh, similar to you know what I learned as local color in literature classes, trying to um, localize the behavior in this case, uh, travel behavior. I'm curious that you can speak on, uh, you did a good job describing the specifics, but what do you guys take away from being, you know, like uh, residents versus visitors and how that plays into this local travel behavior aspect? Uh, any any thoughts on that? You, you definitely see when we were down there, you definitely see um, the you can tell who the resident motorists are versus the, the visitors. And I'm a perfect example because. I had to drive on the left side of the road with the roundabout. So I was actually obeying the speed limit at all times, you know, trying to be cautious of my surroundings. And I had people flying past me 20 miles per hour over the speed limit, basically just so mad at me because I was, I was in their way. So you could kind of tell who's a resident and who is a first time visitor trying to learn the ropes of the, of the roadway system. Um, one question came in regarding, you know, of, of this effort. Can you can you elaborate a little bit regarding the level of effort involved? Um, like uh, whether you want to talk about like calendar time or just project time. Um, just you know, it's a very thorough modeling effort. Clearly, um, anything that you guys can share regarding that level of effort and um, you know any 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 resources that you pulled in from you know, other, uh, any, you know, PTV specific uh, guidance at all that might have occurred or not, that that's a question that, that came in as well. So maybe you guys can elaborate a little bit on your project time frame. Yeah, uh, projects like this usually take about a year, um, you know, from once you sort of sign the contract and get moving, um, you know, usually a year to 15 months to, to complete. Um, this one, you know, included a lot of uh, local survey and observations, which were really necessary. So an 18 month time frame is probably pretty appropriate for something like this. Um, you know, fortunately for us, we had done a similar process like this or similar processes to this um, a few times before. So we had the bugs kicked out, but uh, I think, you know, generally, I think Lindsay can attest to this. We've had a pretty good experience when we ran into like very specific issues of working with the uh, PTV team to address things, you know, either immediately or to find a workaround while they could be addressed. We, we found that the team was pretty responsive. Okay, great. Um, in terms of this integrated modeling approach that you guys are presenting here, is this things that as as you're working in other locations as consultants that you're finding um, your other clients being interested in, or are you guys promoting that, you know, as 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 the best method 
for um, doing these types of, of evaluations? Yeah, we, we did this for the first time a few years ago, actually in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, for the city of Kansas City, where we uh, used a, a Visium VSIM model with uh, Anim Adaptive. And uh, over time, we found uh, that it's actually a, a pretty effective and a pretty efficient way to go about this. Um, from, a, from a client perspective or an agency perspective, a little bit of an upfront investment in a tool like this really saves uh, consulting fees down the line. Because you know, if you're in Kansas City, Missouri, for example, and you use the model we developed for them, um, you don't have to pay somebody to like redevelop or develop one-off models. And so that you know, they were able to use it to evaluate your streetcar. Uh, in Grand Cayman's perspective, they've been able to use, um, really quickly um, evaluate a number of projects since this one has been complete. So something that would have normally taken a consultant team or a local team, you know, three months to finish, they can evaluate it in a week or two. If they uh, get a call from, you know, the ministry that they need an answer immediately and they're happy with the vision results, they can provide that answer the same day if they need to. So. Great. Cool. A um, couple more questions uh, with regards to the roundabout metering that you guys described. Can you talk about um, being uh, just just the, the mechanism for that? Was it equipment based or uh, police metering the traffic? Do you... I guess the, the actual implementation, um, the, the first implementation was, you know, something that we evaluated and they actually used equipment to implement it. And then, uh, you know, Lindsay described the scenario where they were going to look, look at implementing it at a second location and the uh, police officer was able to try it before they invested in the equipment. Uh, question, did the NRA know that they wanted to use the Zoom vSIM multi-resolution model or did you convince them that that was the best approach? Well, we, um, we did a software investigation as part of the project and evaluated a, a number of different tools. So yeah, they didn't uh, specify that this was the, uh, the toolbox that they wanted to use. Although I think they were active Bistro users before this, so they had definitely have familiarity with the PTV products. Um, let's see here, sorry, I think I saw another one. Um, anything you can speak to of how the model, uh, will it be updated on an ongoing basis? It, it kind of sounds like it's set up to be that way. Is that something you're aware of what their, what their plans are? Yeah, they, um, they're, they plan on updating it periodically. You know, for example, after their next census, they've made some, uh, enhancements to their census toolbox based on some insights we shared with them. And I'd imagine that once that comes out, they'll be interested in updating the, uh, you know, the Visum portion of the model. And I would uh, would imagine that as other elements, uh, components come online, they would be interested in updating those as well. Great. So one, one last question. I, I've been made aware during the course of your presentation that there's a a, uh, a, a location uh, that uh, that is promoted quite heavily there on uh, Grand Cayman. So the question is, uh, Hey, how much demand did you find for travelers that just wanted to go to hell? <laughs> Surprisingly, when we did the intercept surveys, um, we, we had an, an excellent sample size of those surveys between the crews and the long-term residents. And there were quite a few that that was their first spot to go to. <laughs> All right. Well, I won't call out the wonderful person who prompted me with that question, but uh, he's, he's a, a long time uh, 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 professional acquaintance and colleague. So I'll just leave it at that. But thank you for that. And it was a good transition. Thanks to both of you for your presentation, of course. A great, great illustration of your applications of the PTB tools. And it's interesting to see what's going on um, in Grand Cayman. So thank you both very much.